the things that my kids really loved was just like there's nothing better going out and grabbing a yellow crookneck squash or zucchini and you're cutting it and as you're walking towards the house to cook it, it's just a clear liquid is dripping out of it. And then you cook it, and my kids are like, "This is just they got spoiled." I mean, when I say right. that, you know, I'm just like, "Ah," because I hate buying stuff at the grocery store, and it just never tastes the same. I'm like, "I know, isn't it amazing?" Yeah. The garden spoils you, <laughs> man. Garden spoils you, yeah, man. that's for sure. Totally, yeah. Our potential. It's exponential. Hey, what's up, guys? Welcome to another podcast. I am here with my good friend. He's a grower. He's a role model. He's an amazing person. Ken Story, thanks for coming, Ken. Thanks for having me here today, Jack, to yeah. give you my views on the world and and my experiences in life to this point at 58 years old. Amazing, yeah. <laughs> I'm stoked to share with people. People don't know, Ken uh, and I, we share our garden space, our living space. Yeah. And uh, anyways, I want to get into so much today. You know, you're you're a dad, you're like, you've done it in so many ways, but you're also hold it down in our garden, man. Tell us about like your experience with growing. Well, 26 years of doing it. I mean, uh, growing up, my family always had a garden out back. We had a tomato ring that we would throw all the compost in, grow the tomatoes around it. We had bananas. In Florida? Uh, in Florida, uh, Fort Lauderdale. Yeah, you grew up down yeah, here. plantation. So cool. So we had uh, three avocado trees um, on our property. Um, a huge mango, um, and then the neighborhood was was speckled with everything, all the citrus and you know all the other avocado trees and things like that. So in Fort Lauderdale, Fort Lauderdale. And wow, it sounds funny. <clears throat> this weekend, um, I had to go help a friend do something. It was by my old neighborhood, so I was driving through. As you notice, the mango trees now are just in bloom like nobody's business. Beautiful. But this this neighborhood been there since like 1950, Melrose Park. It's a huge area. To drive around and see the trees and how big they were and how with all the mango blossoms right now was kind of like reminding me of growing up. Beautiful. You know, of all the avocado trees. Drove by my house, of course, they had cut them all down because mm -hmm. they would have been huge. Yeah, the, the, the development has changed it right around here, too. Hurricanes, disease, mm -hmm. I'm sure it's that, taking their toll on them, too, and, you know. Different landscape. Yeah. But, cool, um, man. But yeah, you've you've grown here and you grew up north, right? Out west. Yes, yes. I uh, went out to the Pacific Northwest for the last 26 years. Actually, would yeah, mm. I spent 26 years out there. I've been wow. recently back for In Hood years. River area, right? Actually, it was uh, White Salmon, Washington um, yeah. at the base of Mount Adams. Across the river. Across the river. So you live, uh, we lived right on the river, the Columbia River that divides the two states. So It's a beautiful it's area. Beautiful area. And that's where... I started personally gardening at that point. Before that, I lived down here in Fort Lauderdale, you know, had a, lived in an apartment, you know, in the place of doing that stuff. But when, once I got out there and I lived in the country, I'm like, I'm having a garden. And what you do, the garlic they send us, your friends out there? Yeah. Is top notch. Yeah. What, what else did you grow out there? Blackberry, huckleberries, so, all that stuff? On your property, most of the time, you always had blackberries and raspberries that would either be growing. Blackberries are always wild, but um, mm -hmm. I had raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, um, a smattering of everything. You know, all your zucchinis, all your peppers, um, beans, uh, onions, potatoes, garlic. I mean, the list goes on. You can mm -hmm. grow everything there, pretty much. Yeah, that's right. It's yeah. the sweet spot, right? West, just west of those mountains, right? Um, yes, yeah, yeah, just west of, uh, right, right on the edge, you know. Because the other side's like desert, right? The or... where, where I lived uh, was right on the back side, uh, the east east side of the Cascade. So seven miles to the uh, west was rainforest, and five miles to the east was desert. The trees stopped, basically. Wow, you were right on that edge. Right on that edge. Desert and rainforest. Yeah. That's cool. It's crazy. Because the tree, dude, those forests, the Cascade Mountains are beautiful. It's like enchanted forest vibes, you know? It is. It really Huge is. Huge trees. Um, that's a sad thing, too, is because the highway I lived on was one of the main roads that all the log trucks came out of the, mm. the forest with the logs, taking them down to the mill. And the mill was the main industry in the town. It was massive. Huge industry. Huge industry. Renewable. They planted. I watched them. They, they forested, you know all behind my house, but they replant and they, it's like law, right? They have to, but well, they, it's good. For, they, still. they know in 40 years or actually now it's like 20 years that they can harvest again. So it's like mm. a farmer, mm. just their plants take a little longer. Right. They have Christmas tree farms out there. I remember. 
Yeah, we did that. <laughs> I got sucked into that one. I had the kids too. Really? To 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 grow them out? Um, we would either go there or we'd go out to the forest and you'd cut one down. Cool, man. Yeah. So now you're in the tropics. Ken, tell tell us about your kimchi. You've been experimenting, right? Um, yes. Uh, what, that was, stuff is good. But when I was back out in the Northwest, I started doing a lot of canning. Is, okay. uh, making, um, uh, well, you asked me about That's where you learned it. blackberries, raspberries, make jams, jellies, um, applesauce, pear sauce, apple butter, pear butter, all that kind of stuff. Um, Apples. And, yeah. Mm. Everybody has, everybody's, it's kind of like mango trees down here. Everybody has an apple tree or two mm. or three in their yard, literally. Or like citrus. Or a pear. Pear. Yeah. Cherry. Cherries are, are big there too. Mm. Plums? But, uh, yes, plum. I had a um, an Italian plum tree in my yard. Mm. I mean, just by the thousands, they would come off. I mean, you couldn't pick them fast enough. Wow. Um, but that's where I started canning. And I've come down here and I've done canning of, 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 Recently, when we had all this bok choy that we were growing out at the farm, I'm like, what can we do with this? We can't eat it that fast. I can't eat bok choy 24 <laughs> 7. Yeah. We had so much. Yeah. We still do. Yeah, we still do. So I, 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 I said, all of us make some kimchi with it. So, YouTube being. And guys, this stuff is so good. It is, it's really, you, you'd make it like authentic, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. I watched hours of videos i mean that's it's what's so amazing with uh youtube these days is that i can watch the literally these villages in korea i would I, either they have Earthlink or whatever you want to the Starlink, but they're doing these shows with you know goats and everything running around it's so authentic um most of them don't even have subtitles but you kind of get what they're saying but the ones with subtitles you're like yeah you get firsthand how they do it for hundreds of years. Yeah, and it's all pretty, it's all about the same, literally. Some, um, you saw the one at the house when we were watching the master kimchi chef, this lady, this Japanese, oh, it was, was Japanese, it was Korean, sorry. Um, and her just, the hundreds of, of uh, ceramic pots that she had full of, of, of kimchi fermenting and just her style how she made it you know it's like you pick Amazing. that kind of stuff up and and i don't think people realize though but this is also why we do it right you don't need a fridge it's yeah. like a way people have been able to store their you know we have all these groceries like you said bok choy carrots radish you're putting it all in this and you don't even have to you could put it in the shade well, you know, not, I'm not a doomsday prepper or anything like that. Yeah. But I, I do have a concern of like how I'm going to survive when mm. everything does go down. Interesting. And yeah, knowing man. how to smoke fish, smoke meat, cure meat. You're it, saying like trucking and being able to get food from these farms. Just if if the system goes down. Right. So and all of a sudden you, you we don't have electricity. We don't have this fermenting. You can eat other things that you have to refrigerate require electricity, energy, mm -hmm. but fermenting, fermenting doesn't. You, you can, it just continues to ferment, but um, you can eat it. For weeks. For weeks. You can make, and you can ferment tons of stuff. So you don't need refrigeration. Wow. Same thing with like smoking. Like if, if we go down, people like, like you're like, hey, you're a little crazy. I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's like, as long, as long as you know how to do it, you're ahead of the game. Yeah. And it's interesting, man. People are starting to think like we've already been doing this for many seasons. You much longer than me. Yeah. But, but it's like it really is like like what the processing afterwards. What are you going to do if you don't have a fridge or whatever? People are thinking of this stuff after COVID. You're right, man. We're fragile you know, supply chain or whatever you want to call it. The guest we just had here recently, uh, he was telling me about everything he has frozen and in freezers. And I'm like, well, what are you going to do? In the he goes, well, I got a generator. I'm like, well, what are you going to do when you can't? get mm. diesel for your generator and they look at you like you're crazy i'm like oh okay yeah. you've never been through a hurricane have you exactly you know yeah a massive one or a massive you know earth, earth, I, uh, earthquake or something like that where the trucks can't get there and all your stuff just starts rotting yeah you know if it's if it's fermented and it doesn't require uh, refrigeration then you're here you're ahead of the game a little bit yeah hurricanes can turn into mad max real quick right because of that effect you know it's like oh okay it's 90 degrees out now the storm blew through and we don't have ac we don't have a fridge we don't have grocery store products yeah so i mean we did yeah that's why i wanted to experiment with fermenting really and that's where the kimchi thing came along i've been watching some 
you know, videos on like, hey, how, how, how do you survive? I mean, wow. smoking, you know, how to build a s small little shelter to smoke, whether it be fish. That's meat, Mexican. You know, but one of the sad things is you always are going to need, not always, you can't cold smoke, but you need salt, salt, mm -hmm. and right. sugar. Well, we can get salt out of the ocean. I have some buddies that do it. Yes. Eric Joseph Lewis, who came through. I've been to the salt. I've been to the salt uh, mines in um, the Bahamas. I've been to them in Baja, where they let the water in, and I've they, seen it too. Yeah, we were we were when I was in Baja, we'd go out there and get these big chunks of salt. Mm. Um, so but, we do have that resource, but I mean, it is like you said. We were talking about this before the show, but yeah. like that, it it takes work. Like we're out there in the garden. You fish. You put in days fishing to get this this fish. You know, to yeah. live off the land, it takes energy and time and you know so kimchi came back to another way of just utilizing stuff that was in the garden right you know um and like i said most of the time i was uh, canning uh jelly jams sauce i mean apple sauces and tomato sauce when everything was coming in and and you were reaping all these produce yeah, i mean i forget about it. i did i did beans i did um you had my korean pickled garlic right yeah that stuff was bomb oh my was, god uh, your <laughs> garlic spread ken that tomb yeah I learned that from a buddy of mine who was uh, um, the head, the, the manager of this vegan store. And mm. I used to go there for lunch. And I mean, you wouldn't know that you're eating anything vegan. They, their broccoli cheese soup, it was, it was all vegan. There was no dairy or anything. Mm. You wouldn't even, it was the best in the world. I bet. You would never even know that you're eating. Man, you gave that to Ken's, Ken's humble, but literally his stuff is so good. He, you, you brought some stuff too today. Yeah, yeah. You should bust them out. But you you gave that garlic spread to the kids who came and visited. It was gone. Like a huge vat of it. It's so those seven and kids, man, it was so funny to see them just yeah. come in and devour that. It's like it's like two ingredients, you know? Um, lemon, yeah. So what, what this, do you got here? This is some uh yellow um Roma tomatoes, they looked like San Marzano's. They, they said they were yellow San Marzano's, and they did look like them. But this was uh, just some uh, paste tomato that you'd make tomato sauce or anything out of. Um, yellow tomatoes. Yellow. San, San Marzano's, they said. They said. They looked Very like cool. them. Very I you know, I grow a lot of the red San Marzano's. I'm like, these just look like a yellow San Marzano because that's what they are. And out west at that farm? The 710 you picked. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, last yeah. year. Um, so you've had this since last season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's it won't right go bad. On. I yeah. mean, I mean, there's, there's. I mean, I, I don't have a root cellar. It'd be like anything else that mm. you make, even your soups and can uh, you have at home and stuff. You know, if you kept them at a hundred degrees, it's not the best thing to do. Exactly it happens sometimes. Because you have to pressurize that for it to keep, right? Yes and no. T tell no. me, tell um, me. About it. Uh, pressure cooking is for you want to do from like more meats and stuff that you can get botulism from. Got you. Um, like cooked it, soups and stews and stuff. A lot of things with proteins in it. Got uh, it. There's certain beans that you definitely want to pressure cook because you can uh, get botulism from that. And any any meats, any fish and stuff, I definitely would pressure Got you. cook this. Um, you could water bath or slight or slightly pressure cook, but um, once mm. you get it up to its its point. Um, temperature and you're holding it there for like 45 minutes it's fine cool it i mean I've, I've never had like i said i did have some stuff that was around for a year and a half maybe and i mean it, it won't go bad you'll know the lid will raise i mean when you go to take this off right and you go and if the lid pops and it's gassing and you smell it it doesn't smell right like anything you should need it yeah, exactly <laughs> if it's giving you some bad signs um Beautiful, I've had man. very little failure rate in the beginning. Um, I had failure rate, but that was because I was overcooking the jars. I was like thinking, I gotta take these these jars to the next level, and literally was like boiling the stuff inside the jars, and mm. it kind of messed with the seal. What temp do you want to have it at for forty five minutes or whatever? Um, about at least two twenty. Two twenty. Yeah. Right around that boiling point. Yeah. Got gotcha. you. It's boil. I mean, if you put it in a raging boil, I mean, a hard, hard boil, at that point, you might as well just uh, go under a pressure cooker and yeah, just yeah, lock yeah. it down and just don't. I mean, you just when you get into it, I mean, you can uh, really like uh, run up the pressure on the pressure cooker. You don't have, I mean, with stuff mm -hmm. like this, you don't need to. So that's a big experiment, but like super doable. When you, we have a hundred tomatoes out there, you know, it's, 
that you could do that, but tell us about this kimchi is way easier. You literally just pack that into uh, a jar. I don't know about easier. How do you make that? By the way, that was out of the garden. Yeah, yeah everything the, here in here is out of the garden, except what for is the ginger, <laughs> the fish stock, uh, the right, shrimp. Right, um, right. So Salt. M- most, the, the prep is is uh, taking the cabbage and salting it. And so uh, you, you cut it in wedges, and they'll show you this delicate way of, not delicate, but it's putting salt in between all the, the leaves and then laying it there, or you can just put it in a brine, or you can just shake salt all over it and just keep throwing it. And you watch it, it'll start to sweat. And you know three hours, but it really the the telling point is when you can grab it and it's pliable and it won't break. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it takes three hours. Sometimes it takes like the other night. I kind of fell asleep and I got a good soaking all that long. And I got up in the morning. That's what this is. Mm-hmm. It doesn't go bad. It just it was really pliable, which is good. Mm-hmm. So then you take all your um, the main uh, the the ingredients is salt, and then you, you're gonna you're gonna rinse that and then. Um, a fish stock, um, a either a dried brined shrimp or a brined shrimp, and and water. And when I say brine, it's salt. Same thing with the fish um, stock. That's it's, what preserves it, pretty much, right? No, no? it's just thing it just adds flavor because you're not putting a ton of it in there. What preserves it? Um, the fermentation. Yeah, it's just fermenting and the the vinegar. It's, it's cooking. Like... Actually, there's salt, so. Um, okay, but we so it's supposed to just be cabbage, you're saying, but we're just no, like, no, 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 there's like 86 varieties of kimchi. You can make it with just green onions, you no can make way. it with just carrots, you can make it with everything. Yeah, um, you could just uh, cauliflower. Um, there's all different ingredients, but the our main cauliflower is in there, it's good. Yeah, the cauliflower, our carrots, the fioretta, um, the uh, the radish, the uh, I go with bush, Dijon, I don't know, oh, yeah, daikon, 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 yep. sorry. <laughs> But um, yeah, those are good. Yeah, and they're like this big. Yeah, those are real good. So the ones, yeah. Um, so a lot of times they'll add they'll, they'll they all of them want you to put like a an Asian pear or a pear in it. But most of the time that's for the sugar to help it kind of cook a little bit. You can add a you know a tablespoon of sugar depending on how big of the batch you're making, um, to help help it ferment, give it a little sugars. Wow. This is a master class, guys, on storing produce well i mean the thing is is that uh i I do have a restaurant background and i did get a lot of formal training Mm. um i worked with uh jean pierre briere wow he's on the left bank now he owns his cooking school down here and he has a youtube channel and he's amazing to watch and then in my other uh corporate background without back but you learn a lot um Mm -hmm. uh, and plus being a southerner with my mom and and my mom can. My mom made mango chutney every year, uh, mm. sea grape jelly, um, daddle that's, pepper that's jelly. Good. I mean, all that, our, our, our hot sauce, our family's bottled hell with the daddle pepper, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we grow daddle peppers. You started those from seed there. Yeah, yeah. We've, we've made all kinds of batches of hot sauce with it. But, yeah, man, that's uh, kind of gets you um, going to do. Like I said, the thing that got me interested – to do the kimchi was about the fermentation mm-hmm. and i'm actually going to do some pickles here but i figured what would i, what do I, would I eat more of kimchi or pickles mm. what do you what, kimchi. Uh, kimchi kimchi i'm going to make a batch i saw them at the um uh was it saigon market or neighbor's market the other day down on north lake mm. uh, i was getting ready to buy them but i'm like okay i don't have any jars to do them and because mm-hmm. i was making kimchi so next time i'm down i'll buy some little cucumbers and make some fermented mm. Uh, no, cool. Fermental dill, dill pickles, yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, just, Ken, that's a perfect segue, man. You, you, you are definitely a voice of reason in my life in a lot of ways. Just like with your wisdom, tell us about like growing, like raising your kids. Like your son's a stud. Yeah, I don't know him, but like yeah. I'm saying, like what, like what is accountability like? Oh uh, you know? God, accountability. What did you instill in your kids? Or they did call you let they call me the drill sergeant now. I mean, it's like later on, like my, they're 28 <laughs> and 26, and they had a really good life. Don't get me wrong, but yeah, um, yeah, mm. I, I could you kind of say I was like I was a drill sergeant. You really? Know? Yeah. There's, there's you didn't consequences. Let... When I say I never did nothing about beating or anything like that yeah, but yeah, yeah there's rules regulations there's a reason if i'm telling you not to do something it's not because i don't want you to do it it's because you could get hurt mm. mainly mm. or something bad could happen if i say hey um you know watch that knife i'm telling you that for a reason that's right 
And You've been around the corners before. Yeah. And, see- and um, consequences for your actions, accountability. And I used to tell them, I said, you can't fool no fool. You know, that was one of my, and I said, oh, my God, as far as school went, um, I'm like, I told every lie. I did everything in school. Mm-hmm. I, I'm like, come on. I'm like, I'm the best. Don't even, if you don't want to go to school, just tell me you don't want to go to school today. You didn't do your homework and I'll let you stay home. But if you went, oh, I'm like, don't fake. Come on. Right, right. So we had that communication, literally. Yeah, that's good. And, um, being real. Being real and just being in their uh, in their space, like going to the parent-teacher meetings. Um, you know, go, I, it's so funny. Parents, teachers said to me, they're like, you know, it's so funny. The kids, parents that we don't need to come here are the ones that show up. Mm, that says a lot. Interesting. So they're like, they're like, oh, your kid's doing great. It's the ones who parents won't show up are the ones that are struggling, mm-hmm having issues I'm like oh, I'm this here to find out and you know keep the course going because I, f- I figured um that if by the end of eighth grade if they have mastered everything that's been taught to them you know biology english um mathematics um that they're they're pretty much ready for high school and moving on if you don't have that up until that point then it's catch up it's catch up. So my it was really important on me to make sure they had that foundation by eighth, in eighth grade. I mean, like four O was not was I only accepted A's. There was wow. no reason not to have one. If you need a tutor, you need this. We need to. But my kids were three sport athletes too. Mm-hmm. Literally, they were all stars. And so they played every day after school or on the weekends, and that was a privilege. It wasn't a ride. It was a privilege. Mm-hmm. And they knew that if they didn't get the grades, they wouldn't be doing that. Mm, yeah so um and also wouldn't be playing xbox and all that other kind of stuff mm. so um this one you, accountability you got him in the garden yeah yeah um of my course. daughter was way more interested than my son um i would get him more like this you know doing some of the physical stuff my daughter uh she was definitely more involved than he was um uh you know i was telling you about the love cup this is, and so i coached little league Uh, from like third, fourth grade on for boys and girls, whether it be soccer, basketball, baseball. They never let me coach football. I don't know why, but (laughs) there's only one coach for football. (laughs) But uh, so being around that, and also when I used to take my children into school, we lived out in the country. So it's like, okay, do I take them in and drop them off for an hour to drive 45 minutes home to turn around and come get them. I'm like, so no, I used to volunteer in the classroom. And whether it be, it was a teacher's aide reading, sitting down, taking them out to you know, recess, making sure kids don't do stuff that kids do. So a lot of times um, I would read to the kids, children, and you just get to see all the different upbringings from mm-hmm. a very young age. Mm-hmm. And then when you coach little leagues, and from that time on, you see the whole thing i mean i could pick kids out i'm like oh you you've you're from a divorced home with Whoa. with no father and or no love no affection mm-hmm. and here's somebody that is giving you their time and you just can't believe that somebody's giving you their time and wants it be part of your day and stuff mm-hmm. so yeah. i with my kids i kind of learned that every on a very young age i always told my children i loved them and i meant it and so every day when i would Take my, I would take my kids to school every day. I would drop them off, and I would always hug them, and I always tell them that I love them. Mm. And if That's they, a if beautiful they, lesson. If they have that first step in the day, the rest of the day is easy. But when they don't have that, that's when they act up. That's when they can't concentrate, you know. You so fill up the love cup. You fill up the love cup every day. That's beautiful. You told me that because I was like, "Can what happened?" Like, and I would see other, like, I would see other families, and not that I mean, I just thought I knew that that would make it easier for my kids. And I, I had a work van. It was a, was New Belgium Brewing. It was a fat tire. It said fat tire. It had the bike on it. It was the brewing van and stuff like that. And I used to drop my kids off um, in the company work car. Yes, um, on the way to school. And remember, my t- sons one day said, "Dad, he goes, can you stop over here and not drive up in front of the school?" And I'm like, "Well, why?" He's like, they make fun of you because of the van and everything. No, they're making fun of you because they're jealous because your father's dropping you off. And they mm. get they get brought in by the bus from Head Start. 
mm. and they're jealous because I'm involved in your life. So just when you go up there, I said, when you get out, I'm going to say, I'm going to yell, hey, I love you. Have a great day. Mm. And I said, they're probably going to pick on you even more now. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but no, and he was like, yeah, because you're like, oh. And I'm like, no, they're just jealous. Mm. You know? Heck yeah. So, you know, having that with raising kids and um, uh, seeing all the, the different upbringings, yeah, it was it was interesting. Interesting, man. Yeah. yeah. Different perspectives. I mean, I had kids... You know, look on my leg where I can't walk. I'm like, come on, man, really? Come on. Can we, you know, it's like, oh, you know, you give me attention. <laughs> I know what you mean, though. Man, that's beautiful. And DNA, like you said. Yeah, um, my, <laughs> I mean, listen, um, <laughs> no, my, but... kids, my kids are way, uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure that, that they were ready for life. No, it's good to empower the, the kids, you know, and like know how to, handle themselves like like that family too that came the beautiful family with like seven kids yeah wasn't it amazing how they like moved with each other and just yeah they didn't they didn't once ask hey where's the where's our, our computer they they went out and they played they played yeah all day long they played all day long yeah they wouldn't sit in front of a computer or xbox even though they probably could if they it's true because you had wi-fi and they played all day, and their dad was building that chicken coop, and he, they would bring him screws and help out. Beautiful, yeah, man. Yeah, man that that is uh, that is um, that's that I, I really I really I actually told told you I have friends that are, are like them too that their kids don't go to school. Mm -hmm. They're actual professional foragers. They have this bus, and they go up and live in the mountains. And his they don't know what iPhones are or. You know the internet. They do know. I mean, they're not that bad, right, but right, they right. just—that's not a part of their life. Most of the time, they're out in the forest and don't have that capability to hook up. And um, just to see how their their children eat. They just walk through my garden, just grab a tomato, start eating it. Grab okra right off the plant, start eating it. I mean, how many kids right. you see going to do that? So, they're just like, oh man, here's how many adults. No, like how many? Look at all this fresh food. My God, they're like, can can, how, can we eat your okra? I'm like, sure, man. You don't eat up, man. Like, Tomatoes, we're like. Yeah. No salt on it or anything. It's eating it out there in the field. It's really. Uh, We'd have a good time, man, with those kids in our garden. Yeah, that 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 garden is popping right now, Ken. Yeah, Ken, yeah, it's that's. Ken, yeah, it's a, it, it, once again, it's a it it is just the love that you you have to like. You be like, God, he you do your garden. Like, well, every day I get up and before I would go to work, a lot of times I'd get up in the morning, just walk around, have a coffee, and just be checking out everything and. Get home in the evening uh, to wind down from the day. Um, mm. <clears throat> go and walk the garden. It's it's definitely brings totally brings you to peace. And when you, it's really cool is when you start everything from seed, you know, and then you see these tomatoes at the end of the season, and you see all this canned tomatoes that you did. And um, the things that my kids really loved was just like there's nothing better going out and grabbing a yellow crookneck squash or zucchini and you're cutting it and as you're walking towards the house to cook it, it's just a clear liquid is dripping out of it and then you cook it and my kids are like this is just they got spoiled i mean when i say that right. you know i'm just like ah it's because i hate buying stuff at the grocery store and it just never tastes the same i'm like i know isn't it amazing yeah. the garden spoils you <laughs> man garden spoils you yeah man. that's for sure totally yeah but when you start from seed it's so true like when there's okra this tall you're it's amazing. Yeah. It's creation, Starting from seed, that was, like I said, that's probably one of the, the most rewarding thing for me out of it. Yeah, or, or, or getting a start. A lot of times, I, I would have so many starts. We'd uh, trade with friends that would have other, other things that I didn't grow or start. And mm -hmm. um, sometimes everything doesn't go as planned either. You know, you can think, oh, I'm going to plant these seeds. And, that's right. And it doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, what, do you, what do you do when that happens, Ken? Uh, uh, it's like this tomato. Those, those tomatoes we have right now, you kind of make exactly. a, try to make those assessment of why and um, uh, yeah. I mean, there's been years out where I live where, man, I had tomato plants over my head, like walking in a jungle, and um, and they're all they're all were uh, tied up and everything like that. And like two years before that, I could barely get them like the waist high. Right. So yeah. Um, uh, no, that's the answer. It's true. You, <laughs> you keep trying. Next season, you try again. Like, I've had seasons where beets are nothing, like no beets, and then beets like crazy. Yeah. All the beets. 
So I definitely keep, notice um you assess and keep going, you know. I definitely notice I notice a warming trend, you know, that's for sure. Here in Florida, everybody I'm talking to warming. Yeah, I mean warming. I mean I'm not going down the rabbit hole and everything like that, but I mean it is what it is. I mean it's it's hard to not see what's mm-hmm. in your face. What's, no, I hear you, man. What's causing it? What how how it can change is, is a whole nother Right, who knows? Who knows? There have been warming periods in the past yeah. too, like Listen, people should go to Glacier National Park. They should go to the Columbia River Gorge and travel across the United States, and they'll see that we've had some pretty big um, changes uh, over this, over our yeah. landscape over the yeah. tens of thousands of years. That's right, man. It affects the climate. Yeah. Big yeah. time. But, uh, but yeah, man, I mean, I've read also in the past, though, Ken, that, like, it's interesting that, like, there was a warming period during, like, it was like a, a boom in Europe. I forget the the age it was like a thousand it was just around that Mm -hmm. yeah and it was like because they say the crops grew better it was like a warm period of time and there was abundance you know Mm. so i'm thinking like the pro like permaculture the problem is the solution you know it's you know we don't know how i guess it'll it'll look but but i'm optimistic you know no i'm saying that today and then the rest of the united states is under what other death come for you know snowstorm that's coming across oh yeah. yeah there's a big thing and um, I mean, we're just, for, I can't, I guess we're fortunate to be down here, but, um, no, it, we are <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah. I mean, I will tell you the 26 years that I grew out in the Northwest, every year was different. Every year wasn't like, I don't know about down here. I mean, I, true, I, I don't man. think I remember, I told you three years ago when I was down here in February, it rained like, like Noah's Ark was coming. Yeah. I remember, I can't remember how. I mean, they, we broke records in that. It was like three years ago in February. Right. And this year, it's there's we don't have any rain. We haven't had literally much, any, any traceable rain that I can think of. Dry. Dry. Yeah. And warm. Yeah. No, it's true. Every year is different. Okay. Every year is different. It's so true. I just talked to this dude. I was like, mangoes are coming. You know, we were just talking about it. Mangoes are coming. He was like, yeah, we'll see. You know, he was like so chill about it. Like, hey. The mangoes aren't there yet, you know? What the wind could come and take it down. Like you really don't know until summertime. So it's just interesting. He's seen thirty seasons and he knows that, you know, the cold could still come even though it's February. Yeah, when I left out there that one summer in June they had three weeks of triple digits, which you that's that's maybe July and August you could do that, but that would be even three weeks is unheard of. And then uh, last year they uh, they called it January because it was so cold and rainy the whole month of June. Um, January. January, <laughs> and um, yeah, so there that was just wow. you know. And I was talking to people they're like, yeah, they're getting well it, to get snow up on the mountains. Not unheard of because Mount Hood's one of the um, year-round skiing resorts in the world. And uh, Mount Hood's awesome. Yeah, it's in, isn't it the second biggest peak in the U.S. Uh, could be. I think. I, I don't think Adams might or Rainier might be a little bit bigger than that. Really? Yeah, that's crazy, man. If people, yeah, they go up on the glacier and hike up on the mountain up there. It's. It's. I mean, I've never summited it, and I've, I've just gone enough up on the glacier. It's pretty trippy. Mm-hmm. It's. It's. It's pretty unique. Pretty cool. Mm-hmm. Ken, I loved having you on today. I. Uh, I just want to ask: Is there anything else you want to share with the audience? No, anything man. at all just, yeah just pay attention to what's going on in our world these days mm-hmm. i mean um totally what, what, if, if you see it it's they're lying to you <laughs> mm, yeah yeah man there's just some crazy <laughs> shit going on yeah um, tell us more about that i just, just don't know what they have what, yeah what, so everybody says that what, uh, my parents even say well who are they i'm like that's right. the question who are they am i you know me i say it's satan the devil mm. he's here he's you yeah. know i'm not a religious person <laughs> but I mean, you we gotta go look at what's going. Here. You gotta look, think what's going on, man. It's a, who not, knows who they is. I but I in my gut, yeah, intuitively, it, I know what you mean. It's it, it's super strange what's going on. Like we talked about, what your grandpa was in, you know, in the World War. Yeah, history's so wild. You know, I think we're just really sheltered and don't realize that a lot of the time. So yeah, we, I guess what my I thing is, we, we just think that making more bombs and making tanks and sending tanks to, to countries and jet fighters is going to solve our world problems. And we just need to, you know, um, they, they I think they want to create, when I say they, who are they, I don't know, but they want to yeah. create this conflict. I think we can all just get along, really. Yeah, I agree. Man. Really. Uh, so I think we can all just get along and, 
and help <laughs> each other out. Isn't that an amazing idea? <laughs> it's just when you when you when you see the resistance against that, mm. um, whether it be on ninety five letting Allergies. letting somebody in on a letting somebody in the lane or mm. the grocery store opening a door for somebody, they look at you down here. They do like, well, well, well why'd you do that? Mm. I'm just trying to be neighborly, right? Yeah, that's beautiful, man. We could all get along. Yeah, it's like when I the little we don't town need that the I war machine. Car, we only had eleven hundred people in the town where I, I raised my kids and stuff, and everybody knew everybody's business it was a small town. But you would open doors and you would be gracious to people, and mm. you know, it, and that changed when you get that changed quickly when I got down here. What? A, yeah, we could we could talk forever on this, but I'm glad you mentioned this, Ken. Yeah, yeah like we, we all get just get along, and you know, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Y'all could just get along. Fill up each other's love cup. Yeah, yeah. Ken, thank you. That's beautiful. Yeah, Closing man. Thank you statement. for having me. And uh, of course, hopefully you don't have to edit too much of this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. It'll be great. I love you, dude. Thank <laughs> I you. I love you too, man. Yeah, it's, it's good. I was, I'm glad we got to know each other and hang out. And uh, yeah, man. Yeah, just looking forward to do what the uh, future has for all of us. Yeah, dude. Let's get it. Yeah, let's keep growing. All right, man. Peace.